Hello, everybody, and welcome to episode number eight of the ongoing series, uh, Shanks Children's Lit Zoom Show. Uh, today, I have a few things I want to do. Uh, I want to uh, introduce uh, fantasy as our next major genre that we are covering and our first since the midterm. And I have some notes I'm going to give you. It's under the file fantasy notes in Canvas. So you'll see uh, these notes uh, in Canvas and you can look at them at your own pace or whatever. But I'll go over that today because there is an assignment that's going to be due uh, by Midnight Wednesday dealing with fantasy. And actually the first work of fantasy that I'm going to ask you to read uh, this week, which would be uh, Charlotte's Web, uh, which is a classic, wonderful example of what we would call light fantasy, which I'll talk about in a minute. And then next week, our second uh, example of fantasy I'm going to ask you to read is uh, another classic, uh, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, which we will call an example of high fantasy, which means that to really enjoy the book, you have to be high. <laughs> no, that's not what it means. It was just a joke. Um, <clears throat> sometimes I just throw these things out just for my own amusement. And hopefully if you laugh, fine. If you don't, I don't know. I'll never know if you laugh or not. You're probably just shaking your head. But anyway, I do want to introduce and talk about fantasy. And I also want to explain uh, the assignment that's due uh, later this week uh, with Charlotte's Web as an example of fantasy. So I want to talk about that. Uh, I also want to talk about and review your answers to the folktale assignment that you did for Thursday. And I, I looked over, over the weekend. And again, I compiled all your answers. And you guys did another, you did a really wonderful job of this. And um, since we didn't cover this before the midterm, I didn't really put a midterm question, or I didn't really have a midterm question on folk tales, because I figured this assignment uh, would give you plenty of practice in uh, experiencing a couple of folk tales and analyzing them. And so since we didn't talk about that before the midterm, I didn't put a folk tale question on the midterm, but we'll kind of touch on that and review that as we wrap up folk tales, fairy tales, and myths, that section, and we'll move on. Uh, a lot of you did some really nice analysis. I hope you enjoyed watching the YouTube uh, versions of these folk tales. I thought this would be a little bit different way to experiencing uh, to experience our uh, material as opposed to reading them. And as I teased some of you in the uh, emails that I sent back with the grade, um, I'm always interested in how people come up with rhymes to remember the two line rhyme. And it's not easy to do, is it? And uh, we had varying degrees of success with this. So I might have a little fun with that today. Uh, just tease you a little bit. Um, it, they aren't easy to do. Uh, and I'm glad I make you do that and not have to do it myself because I'd probably be just as awful as, well, not awful. I shouldn't say that. Uh, some of them were pretty good. Some of them were Oh, just okay. All right, so I do want to talk about folk tales and that assignment, wrap that up a little bit. And I do want to uh, go over the midterm uh, today. Oh, and by the way, let me throw out a, a number here. Uh, 66. 66 is your first number. All right, so I'm actually recording this on Sunday afternoon. Uh, the midterms aren't due until tonight at midnight. So I have not had a chance, obviously, to read any of these or grade any of these. Um, but like I said, they're all due by midnight. I'm not accepting any late uh, answers. So I thought what I'd do, I'm going to post this video on Monday as usual. So I'll go over the uh, potential answers to each of the questions. And if you and then obviously I'll start grading the exams uh, on Monday, uh, which will be today as you're watching it. 
And um, so hopefully by going over the the answers that I was looking for, you'll have a pretty good idea of what I was looking for. And um, hopefully you were able to answer the questions along the same lines. And when I send back uh, by email the results of your midterm exam, um, if you have any questions about why I took some points off for whatever question or whatever, individually, then please, you know, send me an email if you have any questions about that. But hopefully by going over the answers that I was looking for today, you'll have a pretty good idea uh, of why maybe you missed a few points here and there if that's the case, okay? Also, as I mentioned last week, uh, when I start grading these and I start sending back uh, the midterm exam grades, I'll also include in the email uh, where you stand. Uh, grade-wise in the course, as we are now at really the official midterm point of the class. Uh, this is the eight, eighth session. Uh, we have eight more to go. We're four weeks in, and we still have about four weeks to go. So it goes pretty quick. It has gone pretty quick. And thanks for sticking with me. So uh, I will be receiving and grading uh, the midterm starting Monday today. And hopefully in the next day or two, you will get your results back for not only your midterm exam, but also where you stand course-wise. And if you have any questions about that, uh, feel free to email me about that as well. So I want to talk about fantasy. I want to talk about folktales. And then I also want to talk about um, the midterm. Uh, so that's what's on tap for the day. Um, did I give you a number? Oh, yeah, I did. I already gave you one. Uh, 66 was the first number. Let's give you a second number even before I go any further. 78. 78 is your second number. Okay. All right. First, let me explain the homework, and it ties in with fantasy and Charlotte's Web. And again, of course, this is in Canvas, that top file, just as usual. Um, so this is class eight. Uh, here are the assignments due by midnight Wednesday, July 5th. Now, I realize that, you know, we're in the middle of uh, a holiday week. We have July 4th on Tuesday, but I have to kind of keep going. And um, I would say that if if there is absolutely no way you can possibly get your assignment done by midnight July 5th and you have a really good reason you might email me I might give you an extension because I realize we're you know we have a holiday uh, Tuesday but I really think you can get this done and you'll have you'll have well you'll have today and Wednesday even if Tuesday is a lost cause because you have you know celebrations or whatever um, so here are the assignments due by midnight on Wednesday uh, obviously watch this lecture as usual and take note of the numbers in the sequence. So you'll include that in your homework. I'm gonna ask you to read, as I mentioned, uh, Charlotte's Web, which is our first of two examples of fantasy. Um, it's a quick read. I'm gonna ask you to read all of it. Uh, it shouldn't take you that long. And I imagine many of you are probably already familiar with the story, maybe read it when you were kids. Um, one of my memories of grade school, I remember my fourth grade teacher, Mrs. Hughes, who was one of my all-time favorite teachers, uh, each afternoon, if we were good, you know, at the end of the school day, you know, she would read us a chapter or two from Charlotte's Web. And I don't know why I remember that, but I do. Um, teachers affect eternity. They never know where their influence ends. It's one of my favorite quotes. And she was a big influence on me. I, I really love Mrs. Hughes. So please read all of the book. Also, there are some corresponding pages in the packet in Canvas that I'd like you to read, 149 to 157 and 161 to 164. Uh, and you'll need to read those because one of the questions or a couple of questions deal with the information that you will read um, about that. So, and then here is the uh, quiz that you'll do on your own and turn in by midnight on Wednesday, and it has to do with Charlotte's Web. And let me go to that one. All 
I call it the Charlotte's Web Worksheet. And again, this will be worth 30 points. And it's probably a good idea. Instead of reading the book and then doing this, you might kind of keep this in mind as you're reading. And as you come up with it, as you see examples of each of these, you can kind of fill in the gaps as you're reading. Uh, one of the reasons I love this book, and I think one of the reasons why it's remained a classic after all these years, is that I think it really works on a lot of different levels. Uh, E.B. White was really masterful uh, in this deceptively simple little story, a little fantasy for children. Um, uh, and not only effective and interesting and entertaining for children, but I think there are some things in there for adults as well. Uh, I think he satirizes our society in some ways, and I, I won't talk about that today, maybe talk a little bit more about it on Thursday. But there's a lot of different things that he does in this book that I think really make it so effective. And it and it really checks off a lot of the boxes of criteria for judging children's literature. So these are the kinds of things I'm going to ask you to look for as you are reading. And then as it says here, note at least two examples of each one of these. So I'll just go through this real quick to explain what I'm looking for. Uh, one of the things we see in the narration is, and this is usually from Charlotte, because she's a very wise spider. Um, she introduces a lot of <clears throat> challenging words. I guess we would call them vocabulary words if we were teaching. Um, these are words that kids of the age that are reading this book might not know the meaning of these words. And they are introduced. And in most cases, they are defined as well. Charlotte not only brings up the word, but also defines it. So. Among other things, uh, among other criteria for great children's literature, it does broaden our vocabulary, literally speaking. Uh, there's any number of, I guess we'll call them big words that are introduced in the story and defined for the, the child reader. So it helps broaden their vocabulary. I can imagine so many teachers who teach this book probably have a list of vocabulary words. Um, that they ask the students to look out for. And I guess I'm kind of asking you to do the same thing. So give me at least two challenging vocabulary words that are kind of put into the narrative that these are, these are words that children probably didn't know before they read the book, but now they do. Uh, another great thing about the book is that it's very educational, uh, particularly about farm life and about nature uh, and about animals. And if you're a city kid like me and you were reading this book when you were a little kid, uh, you learn a lot about what it's like to live on the farm, uh, educational information. So any number of bits of interesting information are dropped into the story uh, through the course of the narrative. So be on the lookout for those and give me, quote for me, two of those examples of that. Uh, another great thing, I love the descriptions in this book. Uh, White does a great job of using the different senses as he's describing these places. There's basically two main settings in the story. One is the farm and then one is the, the county fair. And in both cases, uh, we have scenes where not only what can be seen is described, but again, and don't, don't rely on on sight senses, uh, pick out, and again, you can find these as you're reading, times when perhaps sounds are described or smells very vividly are described, or maybe what something tastes like or what something feels like. So a lot of great sensory details in the story. Uh, four and five kind of go together. Uh, this is just one and a million examples of works for children where the main characters are animals and not real people. But I think that Wilbur is kind of the stand-in for a child in the story. Wilbur is very, well, it depends on how you feel about Wilbur. He can be pretty annoying, but I, you could say he has a lot of childlike qualities to him. Or if you're kind of annoyed with him, you could say he has a lot of childish qualities to him. But I think he represents 
children. So he's a pig, but I think he's he represents children. So give me two examples in the story that show that he kind of represents uh, the children, the children in all of us, as the phrase goes. All right, then number five is similar. Uh, are there other things in the story that represent or symbolize something other than just what they appear to be? And you could apply that to characters or the setting. I think you could make the case that Charlotte is a very symbolic character. She's a spider, but she's she's more than a spider. I think she represents other things too. So you might ask yourself if if Wilbur represents the child in the story, you know, who or what is uh, Charlotte representing? So what are some other examples? Give me at least two other symbols or symbolic actions or characters that you find in the story. Uh, number six has to do with themes. Uh, I love this about the book as well. Uh, it's not just a cute little story about talking animals. I think it's about something. I think it has messages and lessons that can be learned, um, that children can learn from reading about the story. So what are at least two lessons about life? And I would call them themes that are also dropped in the narrative. Uh, number seven, we always talk about this. What would be the best age and grade for this book? and explain your answer. And I mentioned that uh, our teacher in fourth grade read this, and I thought that was a pretty good age and grade, but you don't have to agree with me. You might go younger or, or older, but answer that question. We always talk about age appropriateness. And then finally, this has to do with what I'm gonna get to in just a minute. Um, there are certain things we look for, and there are certain things that we judge fantasy on, and there are certain things we uh, list as criteria for what makes good fantasy. And one of the things that I'm going to talk about, it almost seems ironic or almost like an oxymoron, but one of the things we look for in good fantasy is how believable is it? Or how re how believable is it? Or realistic is it within the confines of the story? Um, any fantasy, you know, in the back of your mind, you're saying to yourself, well, this could never happen, you know? You know, animals don't talk, you know, and, and spiders don't spin w words in their webs. They're not capable of doing that. So you kind of have to suspend your disbelief and buy into the premise. And one of the things you look for in fantasy is how how effectively does the creator of the work, whether it's the author or the screenwriter or, or, or whoever, how how effectively do they create this fantastical universe in such a way that even though we know it's a fantasy, it's easy for us to buy into it. As opposed to thinking, well, there's a lot of inconsistencies in this fantasy, so I, I, it's hard for me to suspend my disbelief because the author hasn't done a good enough job of convincing me that, that this is real. Or, you know, I shut my brain off for the two hours I'm watching this movie and I, I, I forget that this none of this stuff could ever happen. But it's easy for me to buy into it because the creator has done such an effective job of establishing that. So I'm going to go over the techniques in the fantasy notes uh, in just a second. Uh, so that's what I mean by number eight. How does White in this book use the technique, and it says the BB file. I'm sorry about that, it should be canvas file. I forgot to change that. How does White use the techniques listed in the canvas file to help make the fantasy believable, even though we know that's absurd to believe in all this stuff that's happening in the story? So those are the eight questions I want you to answer. Give me two examples that show each one of those, and that will be your homework for by Wednesday at midnight. Okay. I think I'll give you another number now. How about number 80? 80 is our third number. All right. So to help you do the homework, let me go over the fantasy notes file. And 
in a minute, I'm going to touch on how to make fantasy believable. That's what you see to your right. That's what I was referring to uh, a second ago. Um, fantasy for kids uh, does a lot of different kinds of things. You know, this maybe is their first opportunity to explore other realities other than the ones they live in and to use their imagination. You know, so many of these uh, stories, uh, particularly the ones for kids, you know, we're, we're going to get, you know, Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe is a little bit darker. And of course, there are a lot of dark fantasies for adults now, but we're kind of dealing with the ones for kids. And so many of them just kind of start with the idea, you know, what if, you know, animals could talk? You know, what if you walked into a wardrobe and you came out the other end in a magical place called Narnia? What if, you know, we could travel back and forth in time? What if, you know, we, we could change, change shapes or we could, uh, you know, whatever, you know, and then then take the premise and go with it. Uh, so, so many of these stories, you know, begin with that very intriguing and fun question. Um, Another benefit of fantasy, and this kind of hints at the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe and more mature fantasies, but a lot of times fantasies are a way, and it's kind of, this is kind of like what we were talking about with dystopian fiction. You know, dystopian authors create this world that's really a commentary on this world. Well, in, in a sense, fantasy does that as well, or at least some fantasies do, and maybe not all of them. Uh, a lot of light fantasies don't get into deep issues, uh, but some of the more serious high fantasy stories would. So in some cases, and I think we see a little bit of this, as I mentioned before, I think we see a little bit of this in Charlotte's Web. White is very clever. So there's some things in the story for adults uh, to learn from as well as kids. Uh, there's two ways of classifying fantasy. And I'll, I'll start with the second one first. Light fantasy is maybe geared for the younger children. It's less serious, usually a one-dimensional fantasy. And again, some good examples of this would be Charlotte's Web, James and the Giant Peach, which I used to teach in this class. I don't know if anybody's read that. That's a wonderful book. That's a wonderful example of light fantasy. Um, and then you graduate as you get a little bit older to what we would call high fantasy, which is more serious. So basically these two categories are kind of based on the seriousness of the kind of questions they raise and how they're answered. And now we're getting into things like the Narnia series, which we're gonna read the first book. Uh, certainly Harry Potter would be an example of high fantasy, Lord of the Rings even more so. Uh, so you get, you get the idea, uh, light fantasy, could be something as simple as a you know farm filled with animals who can talk. And that's the basic one-dimensional fantasy that we have. Whereas we get into something like Harry Potter or the Narnia series, Lord of the Rings, et cetera. A um, little bit deeper, maybe darker, a little bit more serious, more violent. Uh, the themes are perhaps a little bit more uh, subtle and important maybe then, or less obvious than say light fantasy, but those are the basic two categories. So, you know, one of the things I might ask our presenters in the fantasy group when they're choosing a work of fantasy to write about, one of the first things they might comment on is they would say, well, I think X, the book I'm writing about or the movie I'm writing about would fall under more of a light fantasy than high or vice versa. You know, that might be one, initial way, introductory way to identify what kind of fantasy uh, we're dealing with. And then you could go on from there. So that's one of the things you might want to bring up or talk about. Um, what is the goal and purpose of fantasy for child readers? Well, there's a couple of different answers to this. And one of them you'll read about in your packet article. Um, I took this from Pierce. Fantasy appeals to the child's need for hope, optimism, possibility, inspiration, use their imagination. Um, a lot of times in fantasy, we have things like equality and justice and idealism that maybe doesn't quite exist yet in our world, unfortunately, but does exist in this fantasy world. And this is the kind of world we should perhaps shoot for or emulate or, or try to 
eventually reach the part or the point where we could maybe live the fantasy that is only a fantasy right now. It's not our reality. Uh, the Cooper uh, article, which you'll read, is, you know, answers the point about that Pierce makes, which one of the goals of fantasy is that it, it serves as an escape, you know, for kids, particularly as they get a little bit older. Um, I talk about this in Lit for Young Adults. The two most popular genres for young adults is fantasy and realistic fiction. And those would seem to be the two most different genres that you can pick from. But it makes sense. You know, once you get a little bit older, and I guess this would apply to the older end of our spectrum, you know, once you get in the sixth, seventh grade, you know, life gets a little bit more complicated and, you know, maybe school isn't quite as much fun as it used to be, or maybe, you know, you're getting picked on, or maybe you're moving around from one place to another, or maybe you don't have any friends, or maybe you're starting to have issues with your parents. And then you come home after kind of a rough day at school and you pick up a fantasy book and you escape for a few hours. Um, and it helps you get away from your problems. Uh, and that we can never, we should never downplay that as a, as a result or a purpose. That's a, that's a great reason for a book to exist, to help a child escape for a while their problems. Or the other popular genre, which we'll eventually talk about in Children's Lit, is realistic. You know, they either love fantasy, which helps them escape, or they love realistic fiction where they can read about other kids in stories that are going through the same kind of crap they're going through. And it makes them, you know, feel better about themselves or they can at least say to themselves, I, I'm, I'm not the only one. I, other people know what this is like. I, I don't feel so bad because in this character, I see what I'm going through. Uh, but Cooper says, well, it's not just an escape, uh, but it's a way for them to draw themselves into uh, who they are and what life is all about and start to think about their relationship to the world they live in uh, because they're reading about a fantastical world. All right. So a couple of different perspectives on what fantasy does for children who are reading it. Uh, another thing I would bring up real quick is the distinction between fantasy and science fiction. There is, the, there is a difference. Uh, they share a lot of the same qualities and characteristics. I guess I would say the main difference between the two is that you know science fiction is usually, if not always, based in some kind of science. Whereas fantasy, I mean, just could never, never, ever happen. Um, whereas in science fiction, there is a possibility that perhaps it makes sense scientifically, at least, or there is the science that would back up a lot of what's being described. Uh, my example of this would be, you know, 150 years ago, you know, we didn't have submarines and we didn't have rocket ships that went to the moon, but we had writers writing about those things. And a lot of the things they envisioned uh, with a little bit of research, they realized, you know, if, if we just had the means to do this, it is possible scientifically. And of course, you know, with, you know, advancements in technology and so on, we eventually did have submarines and we eventually did have rockets that went to the moon. So it wasn't totally outside the realm of possibility that one day those things could happen. Okay. Um, you know, we used to have characters. Uh, I think Dick Tracy was a comic book character from like 80 years ago. And he had a, he had a watch where he, he could see and talk to the people he was talking to. And it was like, oh my God, isn't that amazing? Uh, so they knew back then that this could be possible. We don't have this happening now, but it could be possible. And of course, today, everybody has a cell phone. Everybody has that. Um, so that's the difference. Fantasy is just, you know, there, I, there's no way we could possibly do this ever, but it's not with, in any kind of realm of reality. Whereas science fiction, 
it could happen. All right, now, as I mentioned before, one of the things we look for in judging a work of fantasy is how, be how believable is it within the setup of the story, all right? And again, it sounds like an oxymoron, but it ends up being the thing that either sucks you in and makes you suspend your disbelief, or it's something that you say, there are just too many unrealistic, it seems funny to say this, but you say, there are just too many unrealistic things in this fantasy for me to even buy the fantasy for the two hours I'm watching the movie. All right, so we look for how believable is the setting, how believable is the plot, how believable are, are, are the characters, even if they're like talking animals. And if you'll notice in Charlotte's Web, you know, each of the groups of animals kind of have their own personality. Uh, so he went so far as to do that. And it is important. I ask, why is this important? Uh, because otherwise you don't buy it and you stop watching or you stop reading. And I don't know if you've ever had the experience of, of watching or reading a fantasy where after a while you said, I just, I can't buy this because there are too many inconsistencies even within the fantasy story. All right, so I found a few years ago, a great article by Shapiro, uh, which kind of went through the different things that creators can do to help make their fantasy story, which is totally unrealistic and totally unbelievable on the surface, still make it believable enough that we can buy it and stick with it. And this is the kind of thing I want you to look for, well, both in Charlotte's Web, and this is one of the questions that I'm asking you to do, that's question number eight. Uh, and then also we're gonna see the same thing in The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. So notice what the author can do. First of all, ground the story first in reality before moving into fantasy. So you may notice in a lot of fantasy works, it doesn't start with a fantastical world. It starts with a very familiar, realistic setting, and then eventually transports us into the fantasy world. So it grounds us first in something recognizable. And again, I think it's particularly important for kids. Uh, and then we're transformed into uh, the fantasy world. So we kind of move from the primary world, the realistic world, the one we're familiar with, and then eventually something happens that will take us into the secondary world. So how does White do that, for example? I won't answer that question. That could be part of your answer to the homework question. Another trick, like, well, trick may not be the right word, but another thing you might see in one of these stories is to have, at least in the beginning, some, some character in the story who doesn't buy it, who doesn't believe it, who is a disbeliever, who says, this is ridiculous, that could never happen. Uh, he's the doubting Thomas, if you want to use a cliche that goes back to mythology. Uh, so while the narrator believes the fantasy, or maybe the main character does, there's at least one character in the beginning who says, I, you know, I, I don't buy this. This is ridiculous. And then what happens is at some point in the story, the doubter, you know, becomes a believer. And it's like, well, if this guy or this person buys into it, then there must be something to it. So when they are finally convinced the fantastical events are actually happening, then it makes it easier for the reader who may have had their own doubts to do the same thing. And look for that. Uh, I don't know if we see that necessarily in Charlotte's Web, but we certainly see it in Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. Another thing to look out for is sometimes in these stories, you'll have an authority figure, some wise person who knows everything, and you would expect them to say, oh, this fantasy is ridiculous. But no, the authority figure buys it or at least says it's possible or at least validates it. So you look at somebody who apparently knows what they're doing and is knowledgeable and wise. And if, if they say, well, yeah, that could happen or I kind of buy that, then that might be um, 
that's a, that, that that makes the reader it makes it easier for the reader then to also buy it so you have the doubter who is who becomes a believer that helps you buy into it and then if you have this wise person who you look for for wisdom and if they buy into it well, okay and you'll see that in both charlotte's web and the lion of witch in a wardrobe so look out for that uh number four well one of the questions i'm asking you about charlotte's web is how white so vividly describes the things in the story using the different senses so the details of the setting are critical um so even though you're describing a place that doesn't exist, you do so in such vivid detail using the different senses that, I mean, we feel like we're there, even though, again, the rational part of our brain in the back of our head is saying, well, this could never happen. But, oh my God, I can smell it. I can taste it. I can, I can hear those sounds. And it, it becomes real to me, even if I know in the back of my head, it's not real. And again, white is great at this. Um, and we'll see this also in, in wardrobe as well. Um, so the details, the imagery, so crucial. Uh, also, you know, we're dealing with characters and situations and settings that don't exist, but they all have their own backstory and their own origin. So are, are the characters described vividly? And do you understand where they come from? And do they all speak the same way or do they all come do they come from different places so make the language dialogue dialect consistent for each character or group represented all right that helps you buy into the story and again i think we see this i think we see this in charlotte's web if you'll notice each of the different groups of animals on the farm each kind of have their own personality and their way of speaking uh, well, I just gave you another one. I should stop giving you all the answers. And then finally, try to be, the, uh, the author should try to be as consistent as possible within the fantasy that they've created. Because if there are any inconsistencies, and by the way, I think there are a few in Charlotte's Web that I will point out and maybe we'll talk about on Thursday. I don't want to spoil it for you. I think he does, by and large, a pretty good job of creating this situation that we can believe and buy into, but there are a couple of things that are a little bit inconsistent. Um, I'm not saying that over time and certainly over the period of say a series of books, you can't have characters change their attitudes about things or their actions or their personalities or whatever, but at least those things should be properly motivated. Uh, those changes should be motivated. And my favorite story about this, I don't know how, what you feel about JK Rowling now, um, but I imagine there's still some a lot of Harry Potter fans in the class. Uh, there's a story, and I've read it more than once, so it must be true, that uh, for the last book in the series, she actually hired a fact checker to go through and read the final book and then make sure that everything was consistent with what she had created in the previous books. Um, because even she couldn't keep everything straight in her own head. Uh, so I love that idea, the idea that I need somebody to make sure that the stuff that I have in this last book, you know, is consistent with the stuff I have established in the earlier books, because even I can't keep it all straight. And she must have known, too, that, you know, Potter fans are notorious nerds for this. So if they found anything that wasn't quite right or wasn't consistent with what she had established in the second book and now here in the seventh book, something different. Uh, she must have known that they would call her on this. So um, it's a challenge. I mean, if you're writing something of fantasy, uh, you still have to kind of work within a framework that you've established that is consistent. Because if it's not consistent, then the fantasy sort of falls apart. So those are the things I'm asking you to look for in that last question. In the case of Charlotte's Web, how does White do any of does he do any of these things uh and you can pick out at least two to share with us in that question uh but i think i think he does just about all of this uh so where do we see this in charlotte's web all right so those are the notes on fantasy i have for you let's do another number um 83 
83. All right, as I mentioned, I would like to just spend a few minutes reviewing your answers to the folktale assignment. So let me get that up. And I hope you found this assignment interesting. Uh, you know, one of the general criteria uh, for children's lit is to allow the child to experience um, other cultures uh, and other time periods, you know, uh, to live cathartically through uh, the story, um, to expose them to uh, other religions, uh, other ways of doing things. Um, also, I love folk tales. So many of these deal with origin stories, and every uh, every culture kind of has its own explanation for why this is like this or how this came to be. And some of the stories, again, we 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 don't believe them, or maybe we do. I don't know, uh, but they're kind of fun. And in many cases, as you guys pointed out, and I'm not going to read all of your answers, but you can peruse these on your own. Um, a lot of them have messages and morals. They don't maybe flat out say so. A couple of them do. Uh, it's not like Aesop's fables, though, where they say, and the moral of the story is, just in case you didn't get it. But a lot of them, you know, are, are fun stories. Um, perhaps they're origin stories that we don't really believe, but still they're entertaining and they often come with a message or a moral that is timeless so even though a lot of these stories go back a long long time um, they still have relevance to kids today and i noticed uh well we have stories from vietnam we have african stories we have asian stories we had a couple of american stories uh mentioned uh, the man who never lied I noticed was was mentioned a couple times. The star fruit tree was mentioned a couple times. Um, and again, I don't want to pick on people's rhyme to remember, but I, I just think this is fun. Uh, if you are full of greed, you will never succeed. That's not bad. That's pretty good for the star fruit uh, tree. Uh, the magic apple came from the Middle East. Man who never lied came from Africa. Uh, the hunter uh, comes from Nigeria. John Henry, of course, is a well-known American uh, folktale. By the way, uh, I wish they would make these into DVDs. Uh, last I checked, they were still on VHS, but there was a whole series uh, of adaptations, animated adaptations of folktales and fairy tales. They were called Rabbit Ears Productions. And I recommend you check these out. Uh, you can probably find the VHSs in local libraries. I think they were made mostly in the 80s and 90s, but they 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 are illustrated uh, folk tales and fairy tales, usually narrated by somebody very prominent. And uh, there's a great John Henry. What made me think of it is John Henry is a great one, narrated by the great Denzel Washington. Uh, with music by the late great B.B. King. Um, and there, there's one or two that, that are narrated by uh, the late great, sadly missed Robin Williams narrates a couple of them. So Rabbit Ears Productions. Uh, if you're a teacher, I, I can't recommend those highly enough. You can probably find them on YouTube, you know, so you don't have to get a VHS. My God, nobody has a VHS player anymore. But I, I always wonder why I haven't seen them on DVDs yet. There must be a copyright issue or something. Um, the Fox and the Crane is an Aesop's fable. There's the man who never lied again. Cuckoo comes from Mexico. And again, notice, you know, all of them had a message. All of them have a theme. Something the child can learn from. The First Nation legend of how North America came to be. So a lot of these are origin stories. Here's a pretty good, I like this one. This was a, this was a pretty classy rhyme to remember. Uh, gems are pretty and rare, but don't always provide. Careful, greed and death share the same coin side. Now that, that, 
That's pretty good. The goat who ate tigers was from India. A couple people did the fairy who cried gems from India. Stone soup from Hungary. A stone is not just a rock on its own. Instead, it is a stone that could feed a whole home. Star, uh, star fruit tree again mentioned from Vietnam. How Tiger Got His Stripes. You know, again, another origin story. So if a kid ever wondered, ever wondered yeah, how did the tiger get his stripes? You know, this is a cute little story that talks about it. But there are themes here. A potential theme is to avoid being too prideful as it could blind you, much like the tiger's pride blinded him until it was too late. So, you know, there's a message there. There's a moral there as well. As well. Uh, why the sky is far away. Another origin story. Over 500 years old. Like I said, some of these go way, way back. <clears throat> Again, how North America came to be. The magic pot, the magic pot from Asia, China. If you wish you had what your neighbors got, walk a mile in your own shoes and hope you find a magic pot. Why koala has a stumpy tail from Australia. So check these out. There's a wide variety of them from different uh, areas. And it seemed like most of you enjoyed uh, watching the animated version of these books. Some of you had some interesting criticisms of them. Um, and again, particularly note the messages. So it's telling a story, maybe explaining something along the way. But I think the messages, the moral of the story, that's kind of why I wanted you to do the rhyme for the, the rhyme to remember, because that kind of focuses on, you know, if I had to sum up the story, what's the story about? Or what's the story teaching? That's what the rhyme was all about. So I thank you for those. And again, if you're interested in checking out a couple other videos other than the two that you did, and again, if we were in a classroom situation, we'd talk more about this. And I'd be curious to, I'd probably ask students about, well, wh what made you pick these two? Because there was a big, long list I, I gave you, you know, so you, all you had to go by was the title. And then I think I also included, you know, where the story came from. So I would have been curious to know, you know, why did you, um, for example, why did the student pick stone soup? and the star fruit tree out of the, all the other ones. I, I would have been interested to know that. Uh, maybe I should have made that one of the questions. Yeah, why did, why did you pick this? But I didn't do that, but it would have been interesting to talk about. It. All right, so thank you for that. Those were very, very good. All right, the last thing I wanted to do today is go over the midterm exam and basically what was expected. And I actually wrote down the basic answers here, if I can find them. Hold on a second. Okay, so real quick. And again, if you have any questions after I give you back your uh, score on your midterm uh, about individual questions or whatever, uh, feel free to ask me this week, you know, after you get the results back. But the first question was, how, how are any four mythological archetypes found in the Hunger Games? And of course, we spent quite a bit of time on that. You did a, you did a quiz on this. And there's so many to choose from. And I, I just listed a few from the hero myth, you know, from Campbell and Seeger. And then I gave you a list of qualities of the hero myth. Um, and so there's so many uh, we have monsters, the mentor, the journey, 
uh, loyal band of companions, the quest, the task, the fall, the underworld. Uh, so many different character archetypes, including the mentor and, you know, uh, the, the shadow and um, the damsel in distress. And I mean, I there's a thousand of them. I think most people will probably do really well on that question. Uh, number two, besides language and violence, which I thought, you know, anybody could come up with, whether they've taken the class or not. What are three other reasons why books are banned or challenged? And I listed them here besides, um, besides language and violence. And then I also ask you, uh, could there ever be a justification for banning a book for children to read? Explain a yes or no answer. And, you know, I, I'm, I'm kind of interested in just how you support your answer. It's not like there's a right or wrong answer to that. It's kind of an opinion question, but I wanted you to answer it. I wanted you to support your answer. So that's what I was grading you on that. I kind of made my preference known about the only reason I could think of for, for banning or censoring a book for kids is age appropriateness. I, I don't know, uh, but that's just me. You might have different opinions on that. All right, question three, I asked you to pick one of the works that was presented by students so far this semester. And there were four that were done in the picture book group. And then there were three that were done in the folktale, fairy tale, myth group. And all of them I thought were quite good. Um, so basically I asked you, uh, choose one of the books given in the student presentations, explain how it meets any three of the criteria or characteristics for the given genre it belongs. So if you picked one of the picture books, you needed to explain uh, how it met any three criteria that we look for for picture books. And if it was a book from the myth, folktale, fairy tale uh, group, uh, do the same thing, only how does it meet any criteria or characteristics of a fairy tale, myth, or folktale? Uh, and of course, uh, if you were one of the seven presenters who have gone so far, you couldn't pick you couldn't pick your own to, to write about because I figure you're an expert on that one. So that's what that question was all about. Uh, question four: What are any three characteristics, conventions, or motifs of classic fairy tales? And I've listed you know some of the characteristics and motifs right there. Uh, there was a big long list that I went over in that lecture. Uh, and then how are each of these motifs evident in one of the fairy tales in the Golden Book collection? So I wanted you to pick one of the, the tales from the collection other than Cinderella or Beauty and the Beast. And I even told you in my preview last week, I said, I'm not going to ask you about Cinderella or Beauty and the Beast because those are so well known that you could answer that even if you hadn't read the Golden Book collection. So I wanted you to pick another story from one of the other ones in that collection and show how it had um, any three of these characteristics or motifs. So hopefully you were able to do that. Uh, there were a couple of articles dealing with uh, what Disney does to fairy tales. Uh, the article, Disney damages fairy tales and historical folklore. Uh, I asked how are three ways Disney does this, according to Jones and Zipes. Those were the people who were quoted in those articles. And here were the main points they made. Uh, the stories are stripped of their meaning. For example, you know, Puss in Boots becomes a young king, so they're changed. A lot of the stories are kind of autobiographical to Disney himself. Uh, many of them are dated in, in the fact that they're patriarchal and perpetuate a male myth. So that's mentioned. Uh, they rob the tales of its voice and changes its form and meaning and moral. Um, the whole idea that the prince saving the princess and the, and the princess needing a savior is a Disney idea that's applied to these stories. And basically, another point that's made in that article is uh, Disney rewrites them to mean what he wants them to mean for his own pleasure and gain. Uh, so those are the particular points that were made in that article. So that's what I'm looking for. I mean, you you could answer that question generally and never have read the article. But what I'm looking for is, did you read the article? And can you quote from the article? I asked you to, you know, when I said, look over these articles, I said, review them and be able to, you know, summarize, you know, three of the main points in each article. So that's kind of what I asked you to do for that article. 
Uh, question six was basically listing. It said, list any three styles of art in picture books and also list any three elements of art. And I have all of them listed there, the different styles and the different elements. So all you had to do there was, was pick three of each and get them correct. Uh, then seven, we've been basing our entire uh, course on this. It's the first thing I go over in the semester is what are some of the, well, it says list any four personal values that children can derive from reading and literature as presented in our packet and in our canvas. And here again are the basic values that we look for. And I just ask you to come up with four of those. So I have a feeling most people will do pretty well on that. And then question eight, you had your choice of two articles to talk about. Uh, first one was explain how the article shows any three of, quote, the five lessons in human goodness in the Hunger Games. So there are five of them. I ask you to come up with three. And there are the five right there. Or the second one was give three reasons Tahir gives that Katniss Everdeen is my hero. And Tahir, like Katniss, because she's powerful, courageous, capable of great rage, is not to be underestimated. And he makes the point that, you know, this makes her empathetic to a lot of adolescent readers, particularly because a lot of teenage girls are like this. He said it, not me. Uh, another couple of qualities that uh, make her uh, Tahir's hero, she's able to adapt. She's not particularly perfect or nice. And she's not always heroic in a world that is ugly. And she's haunted by the killing she does. So those are the specific things that Tahir had to say. Now, I mean, if you came up with general reasons why, you know, Katniss Everdeen is a great hero, uh, but it told me that you really didn't read the article, then I would take off points for that. I mean, this is what I wanted you to, I wanted you to read the article, get somebody else's perspective. I didn't ask you why you think Katniss Everdeen is a hero. I wanted you to know what this critic had to say. So I was testing you on that. So hopefully you were able to give me specific answers that came specifically from the articles that I asked you to review. So, and again, I do give partial credit on questions. So if I ask you, you know, name three things, whatever, and you only came up with two, I would still give you some credit for that. I wouldn't take off all the points. So that's how I grade. Um, I'll, these will start coming in while well, you're watching the video today. Monday. I'm actually recording it on Sunday. But I'll start getting these on Monday. And as I said, I'll start grading them. And sometime in the next day or two, hopefully I'll have those graded and sent to you uh, along with a grade on where you stand course-wise uh, so far this semester. Uh, that would include, obviously, the midterm, which is where 20% of your grade. It would include uh, the scores you've gotten on the various quizzes so far. And again, seven of you have done your presentation already. Uh, the rest of you still need to do your written presentation. So that's worth 100 quiz points. Um, haven't done the author profiles yet, although that is coming up next week. And I'll talk a little bit more about that probably on Thursday. So uh, also on Thursday, I am going to talk about the final paper, uh, which will be due at the very end of the semester, but I wanted to kind of introduce it so you can start thinking about it because again, in summer, we go pretty fast. We're talking about just four weeks away. So I do want to talk about that on Thursday too. I'm, I'm glad I remembered that. Uh, let me throw one last number at you, 91, 91. So we have five numbers today. All right, as always, if you have any questions or issues, uh, let me know. If not, then I will see you again on Thursday. And we'll talk more about Charlotte's Web and kind of wrap that up as well. All right. Have a great, uh, well, I'm doing this on Sunday. Um, hope you're doing well on the exam. Many of you are probably taking the exam as I speak. So we'll see you on Thursday. Uh, have a great couple of days. Thank you.